So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Girish Matrabudam. I am employee number one at Freshworks. And um, I would like to welcome all of you for the North America edition of uh, Against All Odds Startup Summit. Uh, so, this is a, a phenomenal event where we have more than 800 uh, startup founders attending today, live, uh, virtually, of course. And uh, <clears throat> Just a quick intro introduction about uh, the Freshworks for Startups program. So what we do at Freshworks for Startups is, uh, in addition to offering uh, uh, free credits for Freshworks software, uh, we thought we would like to help startups all along the way. So in terms of uh, helping you connect with uh, VCs if you need funding. So as we speak today, there are more than 500 VC meetings uh, set up with startups. Uh, and we also bring mentors uh, for you to learn. And uh, we have uh, partners like uh, Silicon Valley Bank or AWS uh, or uh, Microsoft and others. And we're working with a whole ton of ecosystem players. So Freshworks for Startups is not about Freshworks. It's about the whole ecosystem on how we all come together to help startups. And, and uh, with that, I would like to... Uh, <coughs> Introduce today a very special person who is uh, uh, with us today and uh, to talk to all of you. And, and uh, I, I consider it a rare uh, privilege and honor to have this opportunity to uh, introduce Sir Mike Moritz uh, uh, to all of you. Uh, and uh, for those of uh, Mike needs no introduction, but uh, uh, he is a legendary VC investor and uh, who started his career as a journalist and uh, he has authored several books and he's famous for his investments in Google, in Yahoo, in PayPal, in YouTube, Zappos, Stripe and, and many, many other companies. And, and uh, so welcome, Mike, to the program. It, it's a, a honor and privilege to have you. Uh, it, it's it's nice to be here, uh, um, at least um, in this sort of format, you can't get pelted by tomatoes. Uh, from the audience, but uh... <laughs> I, I, I'm sure uh, it's it's going to be super interesting. And uh, before we start the session, Mike, I, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, surprise you by saying that we have met uh, once before. Uh, this is long back when I was just getting started with uh, Freshworks. This is 2012, and I can I'm going to request Nivas to throw that picture up on the screen to see if you can at least recollect which city this was. Uh, uh, and do you, this was eight years ago. Oh, that's Bangalore. No, it, it was Chennai and, and uh, you were visiting Pine Labs. And, as, I said, it was, as I said, it was Chennai. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, but I think it's, uh, uh, for you, it's all Bangalore. The primary purpose of your visit would have been Bangalore, I'm sure. So. And, and this was in 2012, and we were pitching uh, uh, Freshworks. Uh, at that time, it was called Fresh Desk, and we met you in Pine Lab. So uh, I think... Uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's funny you mention that, but I now actually remember the meeting. It was towards the end of a day. Yes. And, um, yeah. No, I remember. Yeah. I, I didn't remember the city, obviously, but... Uh, so I got one out of two right. <laughs> no, awesome. I just wanted to uh, bring back that uh, nostalgic yeah. moment. And uh, <clears throat> so oh, uh, great. Yeah. I look a lot younger now. <laughs> I think I look fitter too, so I'm happy. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Mike, I wanted to get started with the program uh, with something that you wrote in the Financial Times uh, recently. In May, you actually wrote that the business world can never go back to the way things were. So what we are experiencing now is, is like fundamentally uh, going to change uh, the world as we know it. And several businesses have been forced uh, to fast forward to 2025, right? That's uh, something. Can you tell us what, what are your views on the future? Like how is uh, COVID changing? Um, uh, because there are still many of us uh, optimistic young startup founders. I'm not the young part, but uh, optimistic founders who uh, believe that things will come back to normal and it, uh, life will be uh, same again. And, and, and I would like to hear your uh, views on the future. Ah, 
it, it's not as if I know, obviously, what uh, the future is going to hold for any of us. But I, I uh, feel that COVID has, um, as you were just alluding to, um, it's highlighted um, two or three things, one of which is it's helping the companies that are on the right side of history. And it's making life far more difficult and in some cases terribly painful uh, for companies already facing secular challenges. It's, all, it's already hastened their decline just as it's accelerated the rise of uh, companies that have, like uh, Freshworks, that have um, the tailwinds at their back. And the thing that I think uh, is most interesting um, about this horrible experience that everybody is going through is that it, in one fell swoop, as the lockdown came to various countries around the world, it got rid of the excuses for not doing something remotely. It got rid of the excuses for not having everybody in the office simultaneously. It got rid of the excuses for not being able to do things like um, exercise and those sorts of things um, or other forms of uh, entertainment uh, remotely. It got rid of the excuses for um, not having to um, travel to every city if you're a company doing an IPO roadshow and now you can do it um over uh, over uh, video obviously it got rid of the excuses for universities uh, um, not to do online tuition so it's had all these interesting ripple effects uh many of which are discomforting for people and and painful but it's going to leave people when eventually and with any luck it'll be sooner uh, rather than later, we return to life in a world where we're not afraid of inhaling. Um, we will adjust our lives to some of the habits, not all of the habits, but some of the habits that um, we've adopted um, during this uh, period when we've all been forced to make adjustments. Yeah, very true. And, and uh, so, so when it comes to, because we have a room full of, or, or not a room full of here, so we are doing this conference remotely, just uh, 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 there's no excuse for bringing 800 founders to a, a, a conference uh, uh, venue, right? So, um, so as you said, um, how is the impact of COVID on in your world, the world of venture capital? And uh, from, from our world, from the uh, viewpoint of startups who are at least fundraising, uh, like w what is going to uh, change in uh, or how have things already changed uh, in terms of VC funding and, and fundraising? Well, I suspect it was the same for you as it was for other people who are uh, watching and listening at the moment, that there was a period of adjustment um, in, again, depending in which country um, you're in, but in North America, the period of dislocation and adjustment was really during the second half of March. And when, um, if you were operating a business, you had to figure out how to um, deal with the challenges that, of uh, working remotely. Some of them were sort of basic infrastructure and then some depending on the of the um, employees at a particular company, it might be the challenges of, uh, taking care of young children while they're trying to work from home or working from a cramped uh, apartment or uh, various other challenges. So I think people went through that period of adjustment. They also uh, went through this um, period where, you know, they lacked the community of their office mates or their customers or um, uh, meetings with suppliers or whatever, whatever it was. And obviously there are consequences to that but i think for us anyway at sequoia as soon as we went through that what in retrospect is a very was a very abbreviated form of adjustment um on the surface you wouldn't notice any difference in our business 
um, we uh, are uh, finding um, lots of places to invest. We've been very active at uh, the seed stage, at the venture stage, at the growth equity stage um, in North America and elsewhere around the world. And um, my guess is when you look at numbers about the numbers of companies that have got financed, the numbers uh, and the way that revenue grew and all the rest of it in um, 2020 versus uh, previous years, um, if you're looking from uh, from afar, you won't actually notice much difference. Obviously, some companies have been affected both, as we were talking about, both positively and negatively. Um, but the rhythm of our business um, uh, ha has not changed. Right. <clears throat> so, so I'd like to uh, probably shift a little bit uh, uh, shift gears a little bit to uh, talking about something that you briefly touched upon, right? You said Sequoia is, is uh, like a global firm, right? And you've been making investments all around the world. And um, so if you think a little bit about the current environment, it's forcing countries and companies to think more inward, right? Like it, it seems like they're moving from a, a globalization to more uh, localization of, or more com countries are thinking inward. So, so what would you your advice be to companies like Freshworks uh, who start who are born in one country, right? And and but they want to go uh, uh, global by nature. Um, is there anything? Uh, and I know this because Sequoia has made so many investments uh, in companies like India. But uh, after winning in India, we go to Southeast Asia and and and, and uh, try to win there. And so so, what's happening in the uh, world? And do you see uh, any? uh thing that uh, any advice for companies that are born in a foreign country but want to go global uh, is it going to get more difficult or how should we navigate this well we're all uh, little peas bubbling in a in an ocean of politics as everybody knows and um there's no way that somebody at Freshworks or at Sequoia or elsewhere is going to change the uh, flow of those uh, political oceans. Um, and we all read the same things or in, uh, aware of the same, uh, same trends. And um, I think all, all companies are going to have to do um, what they've always done in the past, which is comply with uh, the requirements of um, the countries in which they do business, the political and regulatory infrastructure uh, of the companies that, that do business. So to some extent, there's no change. Companies have always done that. What has changed are the things that are outside of our collective control, which are uh, the regulatory and political, political stuff. So I think if um, uh, the people running companies keep a weather eye on local regulations as they always have in the past. Um, they'll be uh, they'll be um, just fine. Um, but obviously, there are, as we all know, um, changes afoot. Yeah. So so let's uh, uh, talk about f uh, founders. Right? You have worked with, uh, or at least through, you have a lifetime of. Uh, uh, interacting and working with the best founders, right? Starting from uh, Bill Gates to Steve Jobs to Google and, and uh, uh, so many other iconic founders. Well, Sorry. Uh, well, I didn't work with, and I, I obviously know Bill and I knew Steve, but I didn't work with them in a no, no. professional capacity as a, as a venture investor, but uh, obviously knew them both when yeah. um, everybody, all of us were, very young. Yeah. When I, okay. When I said work with, sorry, I meant you, you've interacted with and you've uh, had, like you've seen all of them, like you've seen them all. Uh, let me say it that way. So what would, uh, uh, like my question is about uh, what will separate the winning founders from others? What qualities uh, uh, do you think uh, uh, like uh, are, are the best qualities for a startup founder that you have seen? Uh, are there any patterns? Well, you, you are one of those people. So, and you know what it takes to um, 
you know, you showed that slide a little earlier of uh, a journey that you began eight or nine years ago. I'm not exactly sure of the date of the formation of um, Freshworks. So you need to, the, the way I thought about this, the longer I've been in the investment business uh, or in the, in the venture business, um, and obviously it doesn't always work out like this, but what, we're really looking for are um, companies and people who want to go on a journey for 20 years, at least 20 years. You know, you you, you mentioned some of these companies. Microsoft is now, um, I think, almost 50 years old. Apple is about the same age. Google this year, or I think, will be um, 21 years old. Um, and there are a bunch of other companies that Sequoia all over the place has had the good fortune uh, to be a very early investor in. And we, the best thing for us is to be an investor with a founder who shares that sort of desire to be involved with his or her company for a, a generation or um, at least one generation. And as I said, Oftentimes that despite everybody's best efforts and desires that doesn't pan out because of circumstances markets change or you know for whatever reason the company stumbles and trips but the landmark hallmark companies that are wonderful become these long term enduring companies and the founders who start these companies need to have sort of tenacity persistence, uh, desire to persevere against uh, against all odds, as you know, the title of your um, um, event um, suggests, because you're going to encounter all sorts of potholes and things that you never imagined. I mean, just take the chaos of the last year that we're all living through at the moment. You never imagined that when you started Freshworks. It helps. Obviously, if um, at the beginning you have a real sense of purpose about where you want to head and uh, the direction that you uh, want to head. And obviously, you're going to correct your course along the journey. But on the whole, the very best companies will start with a reasonably clear sense uh, the market and business um, that they're going to pursue is true at Microsoft, true at Apple, true at Google, um, true at some of the young companies that were that were investors in today. Um, and the founders are going to need all sorts of skills because um that they're going to be very quick studies because usually very often they're very young uh when they start their companies they many of them don't even have work experience they haven't seen what a really great or good uh company looks like because they started their company maybe they dropped out of school or um, they started it straight up after school so they've got to be curious they've got to be willing to learn they've got to be understand while being very confident about where they want to go, they've also got a, uh, the best founders are just voracious uh, in their thirst for information, whether it's through meeting different people or uh, reading tons of books and um, learning. And, and I'm um, lucky enough to be on the board of a company of, um, uh, of, of somebody who's now I think 37 years old or 38 years old started his company when he was 22 and he says gosh I wish I had known when I was 22 what I know, knew today so it you know it ripples across every aspect um, every aspect of running a company hiring people um, adjusting um, appreciating it, particularly if you you know you're not a a computer scientist or a detailed technology appreciating the power of um, technology um, scaling um, the organization understanding that you have different generations of people that come through your company uh, while you're at the helm learning how to um, sell stuff that you've made particularly if you haven't 
done it before. So um, the very best founders are founders who are able to adjust to these incredible changing circumstances and then embrace this opportunity. Um, that when they started their company, they were um, discerning enough to uh, to spot. So th those are those are some of the traits. But um, you yeah, know, so. you're living proof of it, and uh, you probably can add a whole load more that I missed. Uh, no, I, I'm going to uh, uh, drill down into one aspect that uh, you have said in the past uh, to many founders, entrepreneurs with whom you work with so you say trust your instinct right and and we also uh, uh, live in a world where we are all advised to take data driven decision making right how do these two play out together do you have any uh, stories or or memories where um, because you know what they say right like uh, uh, you can torture data to tell tell you what you want to hear right so uh, so, so how do you balance this? Or, or so are you a believer in instinct and gut more than uh, data? Or how should a founder uh, treat these two? It's, it's a wonderful question. And I'm not sure that there's a right answer. I can tell you what's worked for us. And, um, and others um, at this event will appreciate it because if you're starting a company you actually don't have very much data if you're investing in a seed stage business or a startup uh, company you don't have much data you don't have and particularly if it's a fairly new market think about the person the size of the personal computer business in 1975 there wasn't any data on the personal computer business or um, the search uh, in 1975 or the search business in uh, 1995 or the advertising market in, I mean, the advertising market on the internet in 1995 globally was a million dollars. So there's no data. You also don't have, if you're an investor, you don't have real data on the founders. We were just talking about that. They may not even have a work history. So there's no data there as well then you often don't have data on a product if you're an investor. You know, the product may still be under development. You don't know whether or not it's going to be completed and how good it's going to be and et cetera, et cetera. So we're used to, as a seed stage uh, startup um, uh, investor, we're used to dealing with very little data and imperfect information. Now, obviously, one is aware of trends. Um, but all I know about business plans or PowerPoint presentations is that the numbers are wrong. I don't know which way they're going to be wrong, but they'll, they'll absolutely definitely be wrong. So the way I've always thought about this to answer your question directly about making decisions is, again, back to the theme of the um, event, against all odds, you don't want to make it entirely with your brain. An analysis because you'll just get paralyzed you'll always be searching and yearning for more data and you don't have the perfect information you don't want to rely entirely on your gut or perhaps what your heart uh, tells you because you're going to make an emo a decision that's rooted too much on emotion and feeling Somehow or other, you want to do it halfway between the head and the gut because it requires, as again, as every founder knows, tremendous amount of conviction to uh, want to start a company. If you are uh, an early stage investor like us that um, is interested in in a long journey and you're dealing with this world of uncertainty you also need a lot of conviction to say i'm going to spend the next 10 plus 15 years of my life working with these founders and trying to help this company so that's the way um that that i've always thought about it and you know by background i'm i'm not a technologist i'm not an engineer i'm not a mathematician so um I have always felt that 
to some extent, and I wish I was a computer scientist and a mathematician and more gifted in those circumstances, but in some cases it, it's been a bit of a blessing because it's meant that I haven't got lost in, 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 in spreadsheets and the details of cells and columns and intersections and graphs and all the rest of it, um, which isn't, again, for a moment to decry the importance of that, but um, I've never felt it much of a handicap. I love the answer. Phenomenal. And, and I wish uh, more investors uh, understood that data doesn't give you the picture. And I love when you said you uh, you have to think somewhere in between the head and the gut. That's where the heart is. So, so you're saying take this from the heart. <laughs> so um, love the answer. So I think... Uh, uh, and, and you see, the good thing is it's because most... Most founders don't think uh, investors have a heart. I'm suggesting that uh, investors actually were given one of those organs. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm going to have, add a follow on fun question based on what you just said. Uh, just as a think of it as a practical guide to all the founders. So, so imagine a seed stage startup is uh, pitching to you uh, uh, for let's say 45 minutes. Uh, like. What are one or two things when you see or hear, you will immediately decide no? And and what are one or two things when you uh, see and hear, you think it's worth uh, uh, pursuing uh, uh, the deal as an investor? So so, I, so we should know at least the mistakes uh, that uh, founders will make. Um, so if I'm pitching to you, so I, I hope the question is clear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's it's very clear. Um, I think it's always an enormous help if, when you're starting a company, you can say very succinctly and state very clearly what it is that you hope your company will achieve and why you think it's going to be successful. And it's surprising how many people struggle with struggle to communicate in a cogent, um, succinct manner. And if there isn't that clarity, and then obviously there are lots of questions that follow that, you know, yes, the person uh, may be able to state all of this very uh, simply or perhaps even glibly, uh, but um, uh, you, you need to dig in and, and, and all the rest of it. But I, I've always felt that the art of um, being able to tell a story that has real heft to it, has bones, has structure, um, is if I had to pick one thing, that's the most, uh, most important. Hello. Yeah. I can see that we can hear you, Mike. I've lost. Uh, yeah, I've lost your. Vi uh, I've lost the video of, of you, Garish. But no worries if. Um, oh. If we can still talk. Yeah, I'm back on. <clears throat> can you see me or no? I can't, but I can hear you fine. Okay. Maybe I'll. Uh... Uh, Girish, we're able to see you. Uh, I think it's just um, a small. Um... There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. There you go. Ha! Oh. Oh. The the hero from uh, from backstage <laughs> re-enters. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, you were. I thought you were finishing up a thought, but. Uh, uh, I no, I, I did finish. I, I was just say um, emphasizing the importance of being able to really tell a coherent yeah, story. Yeah, so that, that's a phenomenal advice because I, I a lot of times when young founders uh, uh, come for advice, sometimes they say, "Hey, I pitched to the VC and the VC uh, didn't understand my business at all." Then I ask them, "Whose problem is it? <laughs> it's it's not the VC's fault. It's it's uh, mm -hmm. obviously your fault, right? If you're not telling the right story." So, so I fully aligned with what you just said and and. So, so uh, 
One of the other things, uh, I think uh, you have also said this and uh, Jeff Bezos has also said this on uh, when you are trying to create a business, like keep a day one mindset, right? And don't rest on your laurels. And, and uh, so the challenges uh, for startups uh, keeps changing, right? Like for example, uh, when the price of success. So, so when, when a company is successful, then uh, talent uh, uh, becomes, uh, yeah, I'll give you a moment. I was just turning a light on. I'm, my no, no worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in fact, uh, at Freshworks, we have a, a, a hashtag, it's all okay. Because when people are working from home, uh, we have our co-workers, you saw my dog enter into the room a little while ago. So, so we have hashtag, it's all okay. So, <laughs> Uh, so uh, we are the intrusion for our family. They are not an intrusion to our meetings. So, uh, so the, okay. The question uh, I was going to ask is: uh, earlier uh, stage startups may have uh, difficulty in finding uh, talent, and and as the company becomes more successful, you can find talent. But then the price of success, you pay the price of success, where people want to uh, uh, poach your talent, right? And people may, are willing to pay uh, 2X uh, or 3X uh, to get your people. So uh, what is your take on attracting, both attracting talent for early stage startups and retaining talent for more later stage companies? Are there any uh, lessons that founders can uh, learn based on your experience? It's, sta it's stating the obvious, uh, not, uh, and probably it's germane all, all the way along the journey, um, but it is particularly acute when um, you're forming the uh, starting team, particularly with starting engineers, getting the right half a dozen people in the company, in your engineering ranks at the formation, because that will determine the caliber of um, your engineering and technology organization and in the sorts of businesses that uh, we're involved with, those are often the very, you know, that's the distinctive and competitive edge that the um, company possesses. Um, but, it, I, and people, there are some people who are, um, really interested there's some people are just congenitally interested in working in startups and there are others that for whatever reason everyone's um, constituted differently shy away from um, that risk um, and then but I, you have to have people who are really genuinely interested and excited about the purpose of the company about working with the people that they're going to be working with uh, uh, for for a long time and also particularly in the opening few years i always wish this sort of spirit would continue longer in companies um at a at a at a at a grueling pace um it is very hard work as everyone probably is more than aware of uh, it's much easier to go and work at a large company than to start a small company or to um, go work at a small company. If you want the easy life, that the small companies, startup companies are not where you should go. And then later, the second part of, well, we're all unfortunately victims of these vesting schedules, stock vesting schedules, whether it's, you know, however they're determined that um, where some people are making personal decisions. They're sort of assembling their personal stock portfolio by working for three, four, five years at one company and then moving on to another where um, they're, uh, uh, they're obtaining stock in, a, in, in another business. But then there are also, I can point to lots of companies where particularly the early people, the people who joined in the first 18 months, spend their lives at those companies. And they do have at some point along the way are far more generous. But they've decided that this is their life, this is what they enjoy, this is what they like. But these are, 
intensely uh, personal decisions. And also, I think some companies understand that um, as they um, go along the way, um, uh, they appeal to different people. I think uh, if you dig into things, I, I'm not privy to the actual data, but one of the reasons that um, in the last decade, Microsoft has gotten a new lease on life is that they made it attractive again for the brightest engineers from graduating from university to come join their company. And that's a fantastic thing to be able to do at a 50 year old company it's an astonishing feat so making um the company attractive for um youthful people probably if you're going to do one thing through the life of a company whether it's five or 20 years old um to to be able to explain to someone at the beginning of their sort of professional life, why this is such an enticing, vigorous, challenging, rewarding place to come and work. That that answers a lot of the other questions that are sort of buried within what you were posing. Phenomenal answer. I, I love it, uh, Mike. And I think I'm going to, uh, okay, we are fortunate enough that uh, we still have uh, Freshworks as a place which is attractive for uh, younger talent. But uh, keeping this lesson on for the next 10, 20, 50 years is, is uh, uh, really a, a game-changing uh, answer. So, right. yeah, I, I will make sure that that is my uh, life's purpose. So, <laughs> so and, and uh, I would go to one, one of your passionate uh, uh, um, causes uh, before we take one or two audience questions. So, uh, this is... Uh, uh, so, so we, we talk about you. You have been talking about climate change, right? So, and and, uh, and as, as we are speaking today, we are. Uh, uh, I'm living through one where there is a lot of uh, um, heat waves in California and and uh, wildfires and so on. But but you have actually said, do not. Uh, we cannot afford to ignore the warnings from scientists on climate change, right? And and. Uh, uh, do you see startups playing a role here? Like there are uh, 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 VC funds like Social Capital who are funding companies specifically on, on climate change and uh, stuff like that. Like, like what is Sequoia, is Sequoia doing something there? And But but more my question is about uh, where do you see startups playing a role in, in terms of uh, climate change? What areas uh, can startups create an impact on? It's um, back. Invest? Do you invest from the heart, or do you invest uh, purely from the mind? Obviously, uh, climate change is a huge uh, issue. Uh, it's easy for investors, um, and don't forget, we have real obligations to uh, our investors to uh, to make money for them. That's our number one. Well, it's obviously wonderful if you can do that while being involved with a cause with a company that uh, is making significant contributions. But if you go back 20 years and you look at all the investments that were made in the green tech revolution, which was an effort the way it was marketed by individual starting companies and uh, people who raised specialty purpose funds for that as a way to um, attack climate change. It was a fiasco and a disaster because on the whole, most of those companies um, didn't have business models that uh, um, uh, merited uh, an investment. And a lot of people uh, frittered away um, years of their life or hundreds of millions of dollars in pursuit of those things. Now, the um, opportunities today in in and around uh and we have investments in in this area some of which um are still at a stage of gestation that you know we're not ready to talk about but um there are plenty of opportunities today to uh form companies that address one or more of the associate issues associated uh uh, with um, with climate change, and 
the question that an investor or a founder has to answer, as they've always had to answer, again, we were talking about it a few minutes ago, is, and you were saying uh, some of the advice that um, you give to people who come to see you is, you know, what's the problem that you're trying to solve and who is going to buy um, what you are designing and producing? And are they going to buy it in our collective lifetime? Are you going to have to wait 30 or 40 years or are you prey to uh, the whims of politicians or regulators? Um, but if you can provide answers to those questions, and I think startup companies working in the area of climate, the best ones are going to be able to uh, answer those questions and this will be a fruitful time because this is an area that now has significant tailwinds from uh, politicians in many places around the world but also um, say the 5,000 largest companies in the world. Awesome so I think uh, thank you for that and um, so we are almost out of time but I would like to read out uh, uh, a question from the audience uh, if, if uh, it'd be great if you can answer then uh, I think uh, one of the questions is uh, do we see the uh, do you see the size of rounds and thresholds for annual recurring revenue and other metrics also getting adjusted for series A, B, etc in the new normal so I think the question is we see funding rounds and revenue metrics uh, are they changing in a post-COVID world the context to this question I can probably add, uh, Mike, is a lot of times founders think they have to get to uh, 1 million in revenue before raising Series A or, or things like that. So I think there is some amount of that in this. But but uh, in general, what would you say uh, are, are round sizes getting bigger or smaller or, or where they are? Where they are? Um, like. Well, there are, these days there are these uh, different categories. I mean, we we have regularly uh, in the past and uh, today um, make Series A investments in companies with no revenue. So, um, and obviously there are um, many seed funds uh, around the world as well that uh, that um, uh, do so. Um, so. Um, we've always encouraged people if they if they have a good idea that they think is one of these long-term businesses that um, um, that they really want to devote you know their foreseeable lives to come just come talk to us directly and uh, we're happy to work with others obviously as well but um, uh, as I said um, we many of the most of the companies that we probably finance at an early stage they don't sure. have any revenue so so uh, there are a couple of other questions uh, but uh, since we are out of time i think uh, I, I would uh, uh, probably say thank you uh, mike it was wonderful having you and this is really a, a, a moment of my lifetime so i will cherish it and uh, so um, it's it, and and well that, that, that that's uh, that's nice of you to say, and I'm you know everybody at Sequoia is very grateful um, for the invitation that um, obviously is a collective invitation um, that you issued, and also for being an investor in this fine long-term enduring company um, that you're uh, in the process of of building. And I hope the rest of the event is uh, is really good for you and all Thank the you. attendees. Thanks, Mike. Have a great day. You. Yeah, you too.